and we are live welcome to the heart and hope medicines podcast episode 16 16 yeah i got a good one for this pager right. oh pager all right page i story i don't know if uh christina know who that is but he a shooter anyway <laughs> um we have a special guest and her name is christina minister christina rimmer yes and sir and she is our homie it's my cousin um she got a whole, whole bunch of names cousin sister everything you know um but um she we will be talking about preacher kid that's the name of this episode she is a preacher's kid so yeah. welcome 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 Hey y'all, I'm so excited to be on y'all podcast. All right. <laughs> I'm excited. I am excited. Thank y'all for having me. No problem. No problem. We had to do it. We had to do it. We had to make it work. Uh we tried to make it work last week, but it ain't work. So it worked this week. So we good. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> we're gonna start off basically introducing yourself. Um, who are you? All right. My name is Christina Rimmer. Um, I am a PK, um, but I'm also a preacher, a singer, all that good stuff. Um, I just love the Lord and <laughs> whichever way he tells me to express it, that's what I do. So whether it be through play, singing, through work, nice. whatever you say, that's what I'm going to do. So that's who I am. <laughs> all right so uh let's go with history um so i met christina i think i first met you before i was saved uh i think yeah. you were out with it might have been bowling was it bowling i can't remember the the zach place i know it was d and isha that was the the bridge um but yeah i met you before the during that time i don't remember if we had much of a conversation or anything like that can't remember but once I came to Salt Mine, that's when we became homies. And we call each other cousin now because Christina had a dream that I was her cousin. So therefore, we just start rocking with that. Period. So that's just how it works. You know, the Lord lets you know something. That's that's what it is. Dejan uh, history. Give me how, how y'all met. I actually met Christina when I was 17. Mind you, I'm 30 now. So um, we had music courses together. Um, <laughs> she would come into class and she'd be like, okay, what's this? What's that? Um, and also um, she would visit our church, the church that I was attending at the time. She would have visit, visit that church from time to time. So we just kind of built a relationship over the course of these 13 years. And it's been a wonderful one. I, I say it all the time on this podcast. I probably would not be where I am today if I had not met her because I would not be at Salt Mine at all. So mm -hmm. the relationship has really been a conduit for a lot of good things in my life. So I'm just thankful for it. And I'm just happy that she's still around and I look forward to many years going forward. So that's mm -hmm. lit. That's lit. Um, so recently uh you had a preacher kid conference uh do you call it a conference what do you what do you call it yeah i'll say it was, it was a it was a mini conference but yeah it was a conference we're just gonna call it a conference yeah it was a, it was a and don't say mini conference it was a big conference <laughs> uh, it was a it was a two day two day mm -hmm. joint um the first day was on live facebook live that joint yeah. was i was mm -hmm. tuning in listening that joint was good um and then the second day rocked the house and it was it was lit um let's talk about that um how did that go like did you did it live up to do you feel like you gave exactly what was needed like the picture that guy gave to you do you feel like it was executed Woo. Um, so yeah, I'm going to say, yeah, I also, I learned a lot too. Um, I look at everything that I do. Um, to me, it's more so of if the Lord gives it to you, then it's, ne it can never be a failure. Come on. Um, yeah. And that's what I I've always tell people that they should look at is if it's his will, 
Number one is his bill, and then it's also going to be executed the way that he desires. So um, sometimes just stepping out doesn't mean that it's going to fail. You just have learning encounters and learning experiences on how to do what God has called you to do greater each time. Um, so do I believe that it was a success? Yes. Um, did I learn a lot? Absolutely. Um, God had been speaking to me about that in 2019. And um, in 2019, he was giving it to me. Um, really, even before then, people was inviting me to different preachers, kids, things. And when I would go, I was like, y'all don't like being a preacher's kid. This is like, a, this is something where I don't feel like you like it. I don't feel like when I leave here, I feel excited about being who God has called me to be. Um, mm -hmm. I feel a little bit more defeated. So we're not gonna do this. Like it was just, <laughs> I, I didn't I didn't really like it. Um there's a couple of people who did it well, but then it was some other ones. I was like, this is not it. Um and so the Lord was kind of speaking to me about that, about changing the heart and the mind of his people. But then in 2019, the Lord really started speaking to me about it, especially about paying attention that it's all about heart posture when it comes down to worship with Christ. Mm -hmm. um, it's about your heart posture as far as your life as a Christian. Um, and what's happening is Christians are starting to try to like run. We're like, oh, okay, I got the vision and I want to run. But what is that ball and chain that's stopping you? Each yeah. time. And a lot of times it's unforgiveness. A lot of times it's not knowing how to release people, how to heal from different things that you go through, accepting things that you go through, um, accepting that just as Christ was persecuted and just as Christ, was, that is taking up his full cup. When we take communion, we're not, when we drink that full cup, that's what we're saying. We're saying, Lord, I take the bitter and the sweet. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't always do that well. Sometimes we do it really bad. Yeah. So, as PKs, um, some you learn at an early age that the cup is bitter and sweet. And so yeah. that's how the Lord um, was just dealing with me. And he told me his children are bleeding publicly, but nobody will address their wounds. Yeah. Um, and he said, you can't bring broken people to a broken church. Yeah. Heal the people, you heal the land. So that was the mission. And I believe God did what he, he told me he was going to do. Yeah. Facts. So, so how much of the how much of the conference was healing for you or did the were you going through the healing of a preacher's kid over the course of the conference or was it something that took place prior to you actually putting on the conference? I'm gonna say both. Both. Um because a lot of healing had to take place, especially in my early twenties. Woo, I was angry. <laughs> Um, I was really angry, not necessarily with my parents, even though me and my dad, we act so much alike, we can bump heads. Yeah. It just, and to me, that's not just a PK, that's a kid and their yeah. parents. The yeah. one that you act the most alike, that's the one y'all like, boom, it's like you're yeah. trying to find that balance. But um, with the, the conference, I... You know, when you hear so much garbage that's going on in the, the body of Christ, sometimes you will struggle with, okay, why are we doing this? At this point, we look like the world. So what is the point? Like, what is what is happening? And so um, in that perspective, that's where the Lord was constantly healing me at and, and re, realigning my focus because sometimes we can be programmed. The world tra trains us to program to look for the bad in everything. Yeah. God is like, you should be looking for me in everything because I'm in everything. Um, and then, um, but before then I had to do a lot of healing and I had to learn how to cast your cares upon him. You really have to cast. Um, and sometimes you think you've cast it and you really haven't done anything. So <laughs> that's it. Bouncing around. Do, 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 do. Oh, for real, for real. Yeah. That's a fact. All right, let's get to these questions. All right, what age did you start feeling the pressure of being a preacher kid? So I became a PK at seventeen, and mm -hmm. day one. 
Date so, one. Yeah, date one. So whatever age anybody becomes a PK, I don't care if um, you're a newborn, you gonna feel that pressure. <laughs> No, for real. <laughs> <That's your favorite. laughs> you the one. There is not like a. It's when you walk through a room, you feel it, you see it, you hear it. Um, it is, it is something that being a PK is just like being a celebrity's kid. It's not something that you ask for. It's something you're born into. Um, and a couple of my friends on the virtual. Um, on the Facebook live portion, they explained it so well. Um, my friend Matt, he said, you are immediately taught how to perform before you ever taught a relationship with Christ. Jeez. Yeah. And that is 1000%. Um, you know what you can and cannot do um, immediately. It's like, and Darius said it well. He said, when I hit 12 and became a PK, I was immediately handed a um, handbook and a rule book of what you can and cannot do. He said, day one. He said, and you start learning and sometimes you trip and fall, but then you, when you get back up, you realize I can't do this. I can't do that. I can't be this way. I can't speak this way. I can't sit certain places. It's there is rules on every aspect of it, and so you immediately feel that pressure. Geez, so it's like knowing, so it's like knowing the what, but not knowing the why. Absolutely. So like, or the how. I know what, what, <laughs> or the how. Absolutely. You just, you know what you're not supposed to do, but you don't know why you're not supposed to do it. Yeah, one thousand percent. That is that's deep. All right, let's get to the second question. What are the advantages uh, or dis? What are the advantages and disadvantages of being a preacher's kid? So the advantages is quite, it is a lot of things that is an advantage. Um, Number one, okay, I guess I'll do like the fleshy advantages and then the spiritual advantages. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So the, okay, the material advantages is when you have parents that are of a high name, there are perks to it. People are buying you stuff just because of who your parents are. Yeah. People are giving you discounts and doing different things for you just because of who your parents are. So it's like it's like saying, yeah, my dad's a mama. Oh, well, let me let me get you some free Starbucks. Like, you know, like there's, it's just it comes with that. That's one thing. Um, what's another material way of saying it? Um, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't take too, like I don't take advantage of the materialistic things. But spiritually, I live this supernatural life all the time. Um, it, I put it in this perspective. It's like your parents is Moses. And you watch your parents all the time part Red Seas, talk to God. Pillars of clouds. Like it was yeah. nothing for me to see my parents um casting out demons, um, praying people, praying in the house all day. Like it was like and even as an adult, certain things that my parents did, um, for example, with my mom, I remember my first little boyfriend or whatever, he our conversation shifted. Like he was like, Well, what would you do if I did this? Like everybody knows those conversations. And I was like, I was a shifter. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the conversation shifted. My mother woke up out of her sleep, walked into my room, and was like, um, The Holy Spirit just showed me that your conversation with him has just shifted. He's going to start trying to um, send you down a path that is not like Christ. Christ wants you to remain holy and acceptable unto him. So you need to break up with him now. In the moment she did it? Yes. And she was like, so call him and break up with him. Jesus. <laughs> that was like, that was just uh, I was a... Up. Uh-huh. What age were you? Like, how old were you? 14. And that was a norm. It was a norm for me to have dreams. And um, when we talk about like the spirit of prophecy, you can create an atmosphere of the prophetic in your home. So mm-hmm. I was, I always had dreams. And so I would wake up, tell my dad, hey, I had this dream about this person, this, this, and this, and this happened. And he'd be like, oh, okay. He's like, is this dream for them or is this for you? 
Is this something you should be praying about? Or is this something you need to tell them? They were always like, you live in a home where they're always aware of God and they're always teaching you how to be aware of God. So it was like, it was a norm for me at all times. So it was certain situations where um, at that time, Holy Spirit knew that I didn't recognize God's voice, but I recognized my father's. So mm -hmm. he would come and speak to me and be like, don't go to that party. Don't go this. And it would be as if I heard my dad's voice. And so all of a sudden I'd be like, mm, yeah, I can't go. Why? Girl, it's going to be fun. I'm like, something's going to happen. Literally something happened. Fights broke out, shootouts, different stuff. Now, mind you, I was on the west side and I was roaring. I, you know, I'm raised in the <laughs> oh, So that was the way that Holy Spirit would get to me. And so it was like when you're constantly living a supernatural life, um, no matter where you go, you carry that with you. Um, so it's just a, it's a, it's a blessing to live a life where you've always been aware of God. There is, I've never had a moment where I questioned if he was real. It was more so of, okay, are you going to talk to me the way that you talk to my parents? Are you going to do this the way, like, it was more so of that. It was yeah. never like. I just knew God was where he'd been talking to me. It was just more so of what's our relationship going to be like outside of my parents' relationship with you. So uh, what would you, what would you, what do you think your life would be now if you hadn't had that experience as a preacher? Because there are preacher's kids who don't have those same type of experiences, who their parents are preachers in the church but they come home and they're not building that type of environment they're not discipling their children so what kind of person do you think you would be today if you didn't have that experience um i would be wild um and the reason why I have to say that is because um number one my desires growing up being able to sing, my desires was to be like the next Beyonce. Like that was, and I had that drive and that that mentality of, okay, I want to be successful. I want to, I need to be seen. I, I like, it was sometimes as creatives, you can be so focused in on I must become that next name. I want my name to be seen. I want my name to be glorified. I want to hear the chanting of me. So um, my goal was to be the next actress and singer and stuff like that, that wanted her name glorified. But if the if God would not have given me the parents that always were like, Christina, you need to check your heart. Also, I could hold a grudge, baby. Ooh. If... I have the type of brain where you can do something to me and it doesn't forget. So when you I have that, type, I call it elephants. All yes, and are like elephants. You know that that is brain. that's yeah. my brain. My brain will literally. I can see somebody and be like, "Oh, doo, 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 doo. six three, <laughs> you said it's like that's just how my brain works." And so I would have been like. Those divas, honestly, you know them them people who are like, forget so and so da 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 da. Yeah, you didn't touch yeah. me like that. I I know I would have been that type of person. Housewives you know, of Atlanta. Huh? Housewives of Atlanta type chick. Yes, yes, and that's probably why they irritate me so bad. Uh, those shows and different people like that because I'm like, you that's can say true. you you love God, but you don't. Because when you love them, you're constantly crucifying yourself. You're constantly crucifying those ways. And so yeah. if I wouldn't have had those type of parents, I would be a hot mess. Facts. Um, the yeah. bougie chicks that <laughs> so, so with that, so um, if, are there any disadvantages? Can you say there are any disadvantages to it? Yes. All right. <laughs> let, me, let me get that list. <laughs> <laughs> um, certain disadvantages for sure is you're always it can feel like you're always sharing your parents um, with that like some people have their parents where their parents go to work and then they come home when you're a PK your parents if they are still working they're going to work then they go into church 
they counseling somebody, they're doing something, you're doing like they are constantly busy. They may be in the house, but they're busy. And one thing about preachers is their mind is always on, okay, Lord, what's the next thing for the church? What's the next thing for the church? When all actuality, their kid is like, but I need you and I want your attention. And I really want to interrupt your counseling session right now to tell you I need counseling. But, you know, like, it's just, it's things like that. Um, You can have parents that, for example, oh, I don't know if I should say that. Um, For example, there are some people who weigh their pastoral title heavier than their father or their mother title. So they are nicer, they are kinder to members than they are their children Mm. Um, because their children are hindering them from doing what God has called them to do. Mm. Because sometimes preachers forget that their home is their first ministry. Yeah. Um, And then you also have it where it can be a strife in the home with if you feel as though okay, I need to go to another church so I can grow. And, and it's not saying that I'm you don't feed well. It's not a, a slight against you. It's just what I need right now, I need you to be dad or mom. And I need my pastor to be my pastor. Yeah. Because you need a pastor and you need your parents. And sometimes if... Um, you're in a growing season and it does not mesh well with your parents. You have to work on that parental relationship while you're still being pastored yeah. and learn um, your relationship with Christ even more, gain that wisdom. So that can be, it can cause strife in the home. Um, another disadvantage is the pressures that you always feel. And what can happen is if you feel too much pressure, it is natural in your it's a natural thing for you to want to rebel because you're going to do either. It's a lot of times you'll see PKs who overly strive to be that perfect child for their parents, or you see them do the opposite where it's like, I don't want to be nothing that you've asked me to be at this point. I'm about to free myself. (laughs) And they're not looking at it as they're rebelling against God. They're looking at it as I'm rebelling against you. I'm rebelling against your members because I'm tired of this pressure. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just, it's, it can be, (laughs) it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. That's deep though. Like even when you explain that, like, because Mm -hmm. even I noticed like from people of the world, they'd be like, Oh, this preacher kid, like she, she about their life. Like she on, you know, she be getting that, like she on whatever like that. And, um, it's like, of course, they, they would, like, target them in a sense. Absolutely. But, I, but it's also, like, the perspective that you just said is not that they are rebelling away from God, but they're re- rebelling away from their parents. They're like, I don't want to, I don't want to listen, basically. And we, uh, some people would take it as, like, why? Like, why are you so, like, what's going on? You, you ain't you past it? Like, why are you so wild? Or whatever yeah. like that. But they like, no, I just... I don't have a problem with God. I got a problem with my, my parents, like, you know, whatever like that. So it does make sense. It does make sense when you explain it like that. Yeah. Because even an example is I lived a supernatural life. Yeah. I still had a season of rebelling, rebelling. And it's because I knew how to do church. See, you've given me this rule book, right? You've given me these rules. You've told me what I need to do and how I need to look. So I can put that face on on Sunday and Wednesday. Yeah. And then the other days go do what I want to do. And that's what that people don't recognize is if you give people rules and not recognize that it's not rules, it's boundaries. Yeah. See, because rules sound so harsh. I'm yeah, trying to, yeah. you have to do this. You have to do that. You have to be this. When all actuality I seen this um, gift where it was like the world teaches you that the Bible is a rule book, but God says it's really a guardrail. And if you jump, it's not that I, I it's not that I'm doing this because I want to keep you bound. 
It's because I'm trying to protect you from what's on the other side. Right. And honestly, I had to learn that. And a lot of the stuff that I was I was dealing with was things that I was refusing to give over to God. Not mm. that my parents didn't do what they were supposed to do. Mm. It was me getting to a pivotal moment where I had to choose Christ. Mm. And a lot of times um, what happens is even this is something that we discussed on that virtual conversation, which was just so good, was that um, if church members would have actually tried to disciple and counsel the PKs the way that they wanted their children to be discipled and counseled, that you would actually have less rebelling and less loss. You have more actually walking in the mantle that is already on their life. Yeah. But instead, they expect you to already know, not paying attention, that you're learning just as much as your, their kids are learning. Yeah. Is Your parents are not sitting at home all day saying, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 2 and 12. And it does not mean that just because my comprehension at 12 is the same as your kid at 12. So if your kid don't understand why um, they had the feasts or the Passover or different things, <laughs> they expect me to know. Right. You know, it's so it's it's that unrealistic expectations that this child is not at the same comprehension level as my child. That's absurd to think that. Which to me that's a you're doing your child you're doing both the, the preacher's kid a disservice and you're doing your own child a disservice by belittling your child in comparison to, to another person's child. But yeah. One of the main things that I, I feel like I'm hearing is a lot of times as preacher's kids, you're, as a preacher's kid, preacher's kids are taught how to serve as opposed to building a relationship first, taught service as opposed to building a relationship first. So I want you to speak to that, teach, speak to the importance of building relationship before just pushing the kids out into service. Christ came because he wanted a relationship with his children. That is the foundation of everything. That's the foundation of Christianity. If you pay attention in Genesis, literally God would make an animal, then bring it to Adam and say, Adam, what do you call it? What is that? That is a front, that is a connection. I'm going to create this thing and then I'm going to bring it to you. What do you call it? Oh, okay. This is a hippopotamus. Like, you know, like it's a relationship. And then it said that God came and he will walk in the coolness of night with um, coolness of the day. Sorry. And he will walk with Adam and Eve. So here he is. He's walking with them. He's having a conversation with them. He didn't have to come and serve until the fall happened before it's supposed to be a relationship yeah and so that should be the foundation is that he only had to serve because of fall of the fall he uh, he came because he wants a relationship he came so he could reconnect that relationship so first thing that any child really should be learning is for god so loved the world that he came he loved yeah. you so much that he came just for you yeah he did this just for you in Genesis, he created you in his image and likeness, and he calls you his bride. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, yeah. that, that's not something that's always taught. Yeah. It's, we're always focusing on sin versus relationship. Right. Sin is this big compared to our God. Thanks. It does not matter. And so that was one thing that, um, as a PK, first, when, I, when I first became a PK, I was 17. Then my dad was ordained, like officially ordained and like over the church completely by the time I hit 18. Matter of fact, he was ordained on my birthday. So oh, that was kind of like strike one for me was. <laughs> I just said it's dope. And you was like, oh, no, that's strike one. That was like, <laughs> one was like, I was like. So how dare you take my day away? How and, okay. You? And then because. In our family, birthdays are like a huge thing. Here I am in the church service, all right? And my dad tells me, I want you in tights. Sir, uh, never like them, okay? And then on top of that, um, he took us from the suburbs into the inner city. That was a... Uh, 
a culture shock all by itself. I went from a church where it was like 500 white people, 500 black people. I came to the hood where we now went from like these comfortable chairs to pews that had nails that were stabbing us, a leaky roof. Um, in your butt, all that junk. <laughs> weren't like nailed down all the way so that you were like, they will fall on you and stuff. Kids was getting crushed. It was like, what did you do, sir? Are you sure this is the Lord? Like, <laughs> it was like a whole thing. Um, and so him teaching us like, hey, no, God has called us to serve the city in itself was like, well, why would God do that? Why would he say, okay, we need to leave our comfort and everything. And it was just like, he, yeah. he had to do a lot of explaining. And, but sometimes, especially the generation before us is you do, as I say, and they don't like to do a lot of explaining. I think not that I had parents that were actually yeah. like, this is what the word says. But a lot of times as preachers, they want their congregation to know what the Lord says. And they only want their children to know what the Lord said don't do. Mm, that's good. So that's really good. So as so being a becoming a preacher's kid at the age of 17 and then having to deal with it up until now, how did you handle the moments where because I'm sure it was there are moments where a lot of moments where there, you, you became stressed because of the pressures or having to perform or having to do or having to share your parents with all of these people. How did you handle the moments where you like, man, I just don't want to do this anymore. Like, I just, I can't handle it. I just need to escape. I need to get away. Like, what did you do to come to terms or come to grips with those type of feelings? Okay, I'm going to tell you the bad ways I did it and then the good ways that I did it. Okay. Because um, the the bad ways that I did it was I would, voc- like, I would be very vocal with my parents about it. Mm-hmm. And that would hurt their feelings. And I would discourage my father. Mm. Um, and when you see your parents, the eyebrows drop, the shoulders drop because you just crushed them by what you said. You didn't use any seasoning, like no grace, no mercy, no understanding. And you just, I would crush him. And I would recognize that I would because then he would be sitting in his room contemplating should he pass there. And I knew he was called to it. So those are ways that I would say, don't do it. I'm not saying don't be vocal, but pray before you speak. Um, Actually handle things with grace. That's why it's so funny. My sister Alexis and me are actually very similar in a lot of ways. Um, I just, I've learned my filter. She's learning her filter. Um, So (laughs) it's certain (laughs) things where I'm like, Lexi, that is, that's true. But you just cut. Where's the healing? Where's the band-aid? Where is the, you know, like, where's the other part? And that was certain things that I used to do. Um, And I used to feel like because I'm correct or I'm justified in how I feel, then it deserves me to, like, to say it. That's not true. So I would warn against that. Um, Really, I would warn against that with, not just PKs, but any parent and child relationship, your parent is still a human. And your parent is still God's child. So when you crush them like that, you're not necessarily crushing them. You're literally trying to crush the spirit of God that is in them. And so now you become an enemy of God when you do that. Wow. And um, I had to recognize that. And so that was the way that I was saying that I didn't handle it right. Mm -hmm. Um, Another way I didn't handle it right, I almost fought a few members. Um, That wasn't the right way. (laughs) He said, oh, you're going to catch these hands. You're going to catch these hands. (laughs) You get tired. Um, And so that wasn't a good way to do it um, because now it looks like, and Brandon said it well, 
He said, if your parents are calm, why would you go on a thousand? He said, because then you'll undo everything that God is doing, the testament that God is doing in their life. Yeah. Have I had moments like that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I had little sisters holding me back from trying not to beat somebody up. <laughs> um, because you're naturally protective. Those are your parents. Huh? Yeah. But um, so those are the ways that I didn't do it well. Um, ways that I do it now. Um, and that I've learned to do it since I say around the age of like 24, 25 is, um, now mind you, that means that there was like six years of doing it wrong. And now I'm on the, like the fifth, the five years of doing it better. Um, I'm not going to say it's perfect, but the ways that I handle that is, um, when I feel like I am, tired or drained and want to run away from ministry in a compass, like in, in this entirety, I recognize I have not spent enough time with God. Uh, and that mm, really you're taking it out of the church when really there is a spirit deficit. Mm, there. And so you're, yeah, you're, you're hungering and thirsting after his presence. And now you're finding, you're blaming everything and everyone around you from not getting that. Well, really it's you and it's mm-hmm. your time. Um, and anything that's happening spiritually is always gonna manifest itself naturally. And so those frustrations and stuff is normally a spiritual deficit. Um, mm-hmm. Another thing that I'll do is if there's a certain area, like a certain Okay, I'm really struggling in trusting people, trusting this, trusting that. Trust. I will watch sermons on trust, and I will find scriptures on trust. I'm going to feed myself whatever part of me is not being fulfilled. I have yeah. to feed it. Mm-hmm. I have to feed it with the things of God because your flesh will start saying, you can't trust this person, you can't trust mm-hmm. that. And the Word of God is so specific when it literally says, like you can have all these different giftings, but if you don't have love, you have nothing. Yeah. It literally says that you can be this great person, but if you don't love God's people, you're nothing. So when I know my love is off, that I'm having a real hard time loving your people, I know that I need to be filling myself with more yeah. things of Christ. And so that's how I do that. Now, do I ever have moments where I'm like, Lord, are you saying that this season is up? Because there's that's another thing is if you have served well and now God is saying it's time to move on. I Do I ever listen for those moments? Yes. And a lot of times God is like, no, but it may be coming. Or it may be coming in this area. Or in this area, I need you to start positioning people because I'm going to start sending you out in this area. So sometimes you're uncomfortable because God is trying to get you ready for something else. And so that's another thing where I they that wait upon the Lord. That's that waiting. Let me tell y'all. I'm telling y'all, there are moments where my, my husband is still asleep and I'll sit up in my bed. And I will sit there and wait for the Lord to tell me something about this day, something about that moment. So, like, I'm not going to move until I hear him. And a lot of times um, people don't recognize, like, oh, they that wait upon the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They're thinking that sometimes waiting, sometimes waiting is, is you're working while you wait. And other times it's taking a moment to just listen. Yeah. And I find myself doing that a lot, like especially even in leadership meetings, where I may be getting frustrated with the way certain people are talking, where I'm like, at this point, we need to fire you. Like, this point, this is dead. And I'll sit there, and I'll get quiet, and I'll stare at the, the desk or wherever I'm at, and I'll wait for the Lord to get download something in me that's going to help the situation. Yeah. Because sometimes you can get so frustrated, you're like, I'm about to walk up out, up out of here. Uh, I ain't got time for this. Like, you know, you have your moments, but it's that waiting upon the Lord. So those those three things, I will say, are the main things that I do now that help me in those moments where I'm like, I'm at the end of Christina. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I have, I got, I know this is like a little segue question, but you mentioned 
um, if God tells you that this season is up. How do you, I don't know, I, I don't know if I want to kind of tap into hypotheticals, but at some point, you know, you do you believe that God's going to send you outside of your parents' ministry, like on a permanent basis? Like, okay, Christina is heading her own thing, like not necessarily in a, from a pastoral perspective, but just I'm a, I'm a full-time missions woman or whatever, like whatever, from what, from whatever perspective. How do you believe that your relationship with your parents, if at all, will be strained? Um, my father always tells me like, oh, you know, the Lord is calling you to go somewhere else. I'm fine with that. But I know he's not, like, not completely. I know that. Like, <laughs> I'm not, like, if I'm like, oh, yeah, I feel like I might move to Nashville and stuff, he'd be looking. And I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I know he's not, like, 1,000%, like, okay with it. But I feel like there is a sense of peace that will happen. Um, I always say, I wait for the peace of God, that, that peace of God. Um, pastor always says this, um, you'll know where you're supposed to be when it fit functions and flourishes. Uh, if, if it's stopped doing those three, if I those three F's have ceased, then I know, okay, something's not aligned. Something is not right. So I need to be figuring out, okay, Lord, what is it? That's the point of fasting, y'all. Fasting will open up. God will start giving you dreams. He will He will start, he opens up it all up. But do I believe that our my relationship with my parents will be strained? I believe that they will be hurt for a moment. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily hurt is in the sense of you betrayed me. But this is something that not just my parents have built, but I built with them. Right. Yeah. So this will be taking all of us out of our comfort zone. I like I've yeah. never fully served someone else outside of my parents. It's, so it's, I'm sorry, it's always a it's it's almost a perspective because just watching a lot of different preachers' kids in their 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 unique situations, one of the things that remains constant within every situation is that is the idea that if your parents built this church, you are the heir to the throne. You are supposed to take over this ministry. Mm-hmm. So a, a lot of the sometimes when you have people like yourself who may not be necessarily be the person that's taken over this mm-hmm. ministry as a whole, or other people who may not necessarily be the, the person taking over the ministry as a whole, then it becomes a situation where it's like I said, it strains the relationship. And that's something that I believe that people have to, parents alike, have to, parents and children alike, have to learn how to come to some type of agreement. Well, they really have no choice because if God sends somebody out, they got to follow God. They can't be worried about, even though they will want to cater to and help um, ease your emotions or your feelings, they can't necessarily do that because God has called them elsewhere. So. Yeah. And that and that even goes with sometimes your child is being sent out so that way they can come back with more tools to help you. Come on. That's good. Sometimes it's for a season. Um, and a lot of times, like, for example, even with uh, my sister Jada, she is in Grand Rapids right now in school. And um, her college is a Christian college. So Jada theologically has grown tremendously. She's like, Chrissy, she'll call me. Did you know that there is this, 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 and this? What do you think about this? And because her school doesn't focus heavily on Holy Spirit, she's like, so what does Holy Spirit like deal with this, this, and this? So then we'll start dissecting the scriptures. Like, that's this, that's this. So when, to me, when I hear her do that, I'm like, okay, well, when Jada comes home in summer, People might be surprised of how much she knows theologically. She's not at the church right now. She's actually like in the, um, she's at this daycare. She like works at this church daycare. So she goes to this like other type of church and stuff like that. She's mm-hmm. like, the worship is annoying. I'm like, but well, it's okay, Jada, you know? 
<laughs> but what she's gaining a lot is they are big on biblical principles. So mm-hmm. there's different things that she's learning. So you'll never know if she comes and she's like, hey, dad, we should do um, the theology of the Bible now. We should do this. I'll add this. Allowing your, your child to go allows them to be able to bring back and help. It allows them to be able to say, hey, this is what this church is doing well. This is where I think we can we can help in our area. Or, you know, and so a lot of times it's changing our perspectives. Because a lot of times in the church culture today, we hoard a lot. And that's what the Lord keeps dealing with me about is like we hoard people mm-hmm. really you guys are supposed to be coming in and then going out doing a podcast just like this so you can beget others. You know what Fire. I'm saying? It yeah. shouldn't be that it's only internal. It's like, no, we're building internally so we can go out externally, then yeah. come back and bring more. You know, it's supposed to be an in and out situation, not necessarily, um, oh, you need to stay here. and You can't be going to other people's churches. Like you mentioned earlier, he mentioned earlier that I would go to his church on Fridays. So at that point in my life, this is like me, 17, 18, 19, I knew the Lord was like, Christina, I'm about to knock you right off this horse you think you're about to build. Ain't no Chris saying I say. Ain't no, you know, like you're about to be Christina. <laughs> and, um, and what happened was I needed to be at my church, but I also needed some extra work. Yeah. I needed somebody who was going to see me not as daughter, I needed them to see me as strictly Christina because then they could, what he was doing for me was sometimes when a child is your child, you feel like, oh, I know my child. They're not going to do this. They're not going to do that. They, There's no way you're going to tell me that my child does this. And the yeah. Lord was like, but they're my child and they do do this and they're actually doing this, this, yeah. this, and that. So what happened was on those Friday nights, I was getting that extra word for them to be able to address Christina. Whereas what I was getting in that season from my parents was them addressing daughter mm-hmm. and me learning how to be, because I was over the youth immediately. As soon as I hit 18, I got a room full of teenagers <laughs> and we the same age. So we were going to the same <laughs> thing and the Lord was like, no, I want you to teach them. But I had to go get some extra words somewhere else to help me to be able to teach them and also deal with me. It was almost like I needed a a two part. I needed a person that was going to deal with me as the person and then the other part that was going to deal with the daughter and the minister. Yeah. So it's not a bad thing. Um, But what happens is if, and this is kind of like not said a lot, but sometimes mm-hmm. parents will get jealous because they feel like you needing that extra means that they're not doing their job well, which is mm-hmm. not true. Yeah. There's just different parts of you and God will place different people in your life to feed the different sections of your heart. Right. You get what I'm saying? So it doesn't mean that you are not great at what you do. It just means that in this area, this person has been tailor made to help you in this area. Right. And the God. Fact, yes. Yeah, go ahead. The, the level of comfortability is different too. Like you may not always feel comfortable talking to your daddy about sex. So I need this other person to come along and we need to have this conversation because at the yeah. end of the day, it's about helping me trying to be the best me that I could possibly be. That's the only way that I'll be effective is if I'm striving and pushing to be the best me that I could possibly be. But if what's hindering me from being the best me is having a conversation, avoiding that odd conversation with you, then I ain't never going to be. Yeah, because at the end of the day, me getting healthy is going to help you. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, um, me, man, I can't tell you. There's certain preachers that I listen to on a daily basis. Does that mean that I don't listen to my father? No. But there are certain areas of my life where I'm like, okay, I got to listen to them because they're making me see me in a different place. Yeah. But I'm telling you, your heart posture is everything. Like how he's got hope medicine and open heart. Like this, both of y'all titles 
are everything because that is what the word is. Okay. People, people need to know that there is hope that Mm -hmm. there is a better way. And then you have to have an open heart. Come on. At all times. And allow God to dissect it, have surgery, like all this stuff. And you never know that uh, releasing your child for that season, that they're going to come back with a healthier heart. Yeah. You're going to actually have hope in the mission that you have. Because, listen, uh, sometimes you have to go see how another church is dealing with the inner city so you can come back and be like, hey, this is what we can do. Yeah. 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 That that's that's deep though. Because I would say my perspective, how I could see it, um, because I have Genesis, because um I'm now a parent, it, it so much changes in your thinking when you become a parent a parent because you know, when you just thinking about even when you marry, you're thinking about you and your wife or you know, you and your husband. It's just y'all two. But now you're thinking about a baby and things like that, raising a baby and things like that. And it's like releasing the baby to God. God, this is your child. I have to release this baby to you. And whoever needs to, you know, help develop the baby, you Mm -hmm. know, I'm going to allow for it to happen. Like whatever needs to, you know, even it's crazy because I find myself somewhat being overprotective in a sense because... Sometimes I don't want Genesis to fall. Like in general, like even though yeah, she's good. at the stage where she's walking, mm-hmm. where she walking and she has to fall. And I'm like, oh, oh, uh, uh. Yeah. And yeah. it's like, yeah. if I choose to be overprotective with her, she won't learn. She won't mm-hmm. grow. She won't develop. So I'll be like, all you right, today, <laughs> step back, step back and let her develop step back so it's like even with that as as you're you're talking about how um we have to stop hoarding and things like that that just reminds me like we just got to step back and let god do what he got to do it's not about what about us it's about him whatever he has to do his mission you know about us stepping back and letting him lead because a lot of times we say, God, have your way, whatever. And we don't really want God to have his way. We be having our hands on it like, uh, our way. Right. Yeah. Like, do what uh, I want, kind of. Like, what you like. And, and that's deep, though. That uh, that revelation is deep. Because I definitely find myself like, uh, no, Jenny, don't. Whatever like that. But I have to let her go and let her go through the process of growing. Yeah. 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 Sheesh. That is, yes, B, that's a message all by itself. Come on. Man. Man. Here. That, that legit is <laughs> a message all by itself because honestly, um, certain things that I had learned other places, we had went to Texas and I had asked a question to another person who's a PK. And what? she told me, she said, every PK needs to remember that that is your pap- that's your parents' church. That's not your church. It's the vision God gave them, not you. You are created to help them, not so that way you can lead it yourself and tell them what you think is best. When she, when I tell you that I was like, that was a hardcore rebuke. <laughs> and honestly, once I recognized that, my relationship with my parents got better. Mm. because then I started saying if I did see something that they didn't see I had to trust that God just as much God spoke to me he was speaking to them so it would be certain things where I'd be like daddy um, you know if you want people to really relate to you my generation really isn't walking around in a three piece suit every day and so (laughs) then what I couldn't do was you see Pastor So and So, he ain't wearing no suit oh, because yeah. they sound like you're comparing them. Yeah. And I would just be like, you know, I just really feel like you are really called to my generation. So you, even though your suits are nice, I don't think you should wear them every Sunday. I think you should switch it up. And that's gonna make them more relatable. It's gonna make you like eye to eye. I'm like, you know, just like how you would talk to me. So he was sitting there. So I don't know. All right. Well, I don't know what to wear then. Like, you know, and it made it, <laughs> you know, 
it was something where I wasn't coming at like, you need to stop, you know, because sometimes when you're passionate, so there's a, there's a season where you can be like not passionate about the church and then God will be like, start speaking to you. And then you're really passionate and you're like, no pastor, do this. <laughs> and you're like, and it's coming from a, a, a pure place, but yeah. the delivery is all off. Yeah. And that was one thing that I had to learn was like, okay, this is his church. This is his vision. So what you need to do is listen to his vision and see, okay, Holy Spirit, what do you need me to say to him or reveal to him or whatever that will help him in his vision? So I'd be like, yeah, you know how you said this and this? These are certain things that I've seen that I think could help uh, with what you said. Then yeah. you're like, oh, I like that. I like that. And so it's not our relationship because I wasn't trying to be like another boss or make mm-hmm. him feel like he's not good enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's you have to learn as a PK how to how to see them, for example, my father at home, that's my daddy. But at church, he's my pastor. So I have to approach him two different ways. So but if he's at home, I'll bang on the door. Daddy, you sleep? Like, I'll wake him up like that. But if he's in a meeting with somebody, I honor him. If I'm, I'm going to not, or if it says he's in a meeting or something, then I'm leaving him alone. Or I'll wait and say, hey, pastor, really quick. So-and-so is here. You know, like, there's a different way I'm dressing. Yeah. If we're at home. Daddy, uh, be at the door. You know, that's mm-hmm. a different. You have to. Find that balance. And sometimes as a PK, it's hard for um, families to find that balance to really get in the swing of things. Um, Because I have to tell my dad, even with you asking me, like, what's the disadvantage with sharing and how do I deal with that? I had to be honest with him. It was one vacation we were on. I think we were all on a cruise. We were going to Bahamas. And my daddy was like, so I was thinking about this with the church and I was going to do this with the church. And I was thinking about this and me and all my sisters at the same time. And we were like, we're not mentioning salt mine church on this vacation. We're going to live in this moment because you work 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week. Then we have the church stuff. We're not mentioning them. We don't care if they call or they get a text. We're not talking about them. He busts out laughing. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Because that's that's the thing that people don't understand is when you sit in that office as a pastor, that church comes with you wherever you are. Man. At all times. Like that, their whole, they really care about you. So when people start talking bad about your parents or they start, oh, they got faith. Or starting discord and all that stuff like that, that's a slap in the face to a PK in a major way because it's like you don't understand that their mind is not on you probably five minutes out of the day. You still in a time. We sharing our time and you mad because they gave the other kid the pink basket and your kid got the blue basket. Man. That's the stuff where you were like, Let's square up. (laughs) Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming my time. (laughs) And I think that's what it is, is that that's why um, PKs just want people to actually honor their parents because they don't understand what all happens in the background. And I know that can be hard, um, but sometimes it seems like people will honor their bosses more than their pastor. Mm -hmm. Your pastor is the shepherd of your soul. Yeah. You get yeah, and, and, yeah, and they and they are valuing the, the that their their boss regulates their money. That this is your soul, and this flesh and this world it's gonna it's gonna pass away, it's gonna perish. But your soul right. is what God is gonna judge. So mm-hmm. if you care that much about your soul, why are you so upset that you got to get fifty dollars for his birthday? Mm. You know, it's stuff like that where it's like. For your friend, though, you'll make a full um, bouquet made out of $100 bills. You, you're like, oh, I'm going to give you this, this, and this. But this person is shepherding your soul. That's what I'm always like. When you disrespect our parents or when you're upset that 
they didn't do something you didn't want like that one time, or you didn't understand something, but you throw them away or you treat them. So that's why PKs a lot of times will get hard. Like Benny Hinn's daughter, one day I was sobbing, y'all, and her she was preaching, but I got caught on this one part of her message. And she was talking about her testimony of how she was in clubs, she was drunk, she was high. She she was like, I was a hot mess. She was like, a complete hot mess. <laughs> she said, and it was not because my parents didn't live a holy life or that I felt like they lived a double life. She was like, literally, there was times where she's like, I was sick and I'm watching my dad on TV and he says, put your hand on the on the TV screen and you shall be healed from this, this and this. She said, and I was healed. She mm. said, so I knew God was working through my parents. Mm. She said, well, what got me and made me rebel, she said, was when I started recognizing that some of these um, faithful members or faithful leaders were the ones that were telling these blogs lies about my parents. Mm. When the ones that were um, supposed to be aunts and uncles and godparents in the faith and in the ministry, those are the ones that when they heard one lie about my parents, they bashed them. Or did, She said, I was so angry with God's people that I told him I want nothing to do with God. She said, and my father wept and wept. He would cry and say, baby, please don't say that. God is a good God. And despite what his children may do, don't hold it against him. And she said, and I was so angry with God's people. I wanted nothing to do with God. Yeah. And she's like, that's what people don't understand. She said, is when you see people living a holy and righteous life, sacrificing everything, and then they're treated like garbage. She said, that's what affects a PK the most. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. that? If I could have <laughs> did a false innovation, like I was sobbing. I was sobbing. Um, because people don't understand that. They don't understand that the way you're treating their parents will make them fall faster than a kid at school or anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's how the people who are supposed to love God treat the man and woman of God. And mm -hmm. see, that's why to me this is this is why the, the, the teaching of relationship early is so important. Yes. Because when you understand and you build a relationship with God for yourself, you recognize that this is not God doing your parents wrong. This is not this is just People being people, yeah, will acting out of their flesh instead of being led by the spirit like they're supposed to be. So, and then also, and then also with that, it's funny because, um, honor the thing a lot of people, for instance, but pastor, I honor pastor before I honor my father, and you know why my father wasn't in my life, mm -hmm. so therefore, the so it's just the there's like a, you're learning there. Yeah. There's people yeah. who have all type of crap, you know, that they're coming in with and they don't understand how to honor. Yeah. They yeah. understand something because their parents or something like that. They have mess, messed up parents or whatever like that. So they're having a hard time yeah. adjusting to, Oh, I'm supposed to whatever like that. So it's, it's kind of, it's like, you really have to use wisdom and really have to give them grace. And that's like the biggest thing, like the grace you have to be like, all right, listen here, even though I want to cut you up, yeah. I have to allow for you to develop. And then yeah. also with that, it's allowing for pastor to develop too, pastor yeah. and first lady, to, to, cause they gotta develop that tough skin. Yeah. To, to even be called to the position they're at, they skin has to be tough. Yes. And it's like sometimes we will, as as a kid, you will try to prevent your father from, hey, no, your mom, no, don't do, you know, yeah. because you don't want them to, to you know, go through something, whatever yeah. like that. You don't want them to be hurt and things yeah. like that. Um, but if you prevent it, then you won't allow for them to grow in that area. And I can also see that I can, back to Genesis, I can see myself stopping her from, growing in certain areas because I'm like, ah, no, you might hurt yourself. Yeah. And it's funny because me and my wife battle because I would think, oh, no, she may hurt herself over here. But my wife like, no, you have to let her experience the with the stuff in here, mm -hmm. whatever like that. And I'm just like, 
eh, eh, yeah. ah. <laughs> like you know yeah. but that's right like it's 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 a fine line that you gotta walk you know it's a fine line that you got a little it lie like it's literally i can just see it like a you know you on one of them low little tight ropes and you gotta literally stay on that line and not you know go left or go right you gotta literally stay it say what it, what the word say about the straight narrow path on that yes narrow is the path come on that right she says or is it to there is, is the pathway yeah. to him, right? But wide is the come on, wide it's yeah. it's that right there, that that narrow path that we gotta walk to yeah. to to get to the kingdom. And that's yeah. a fact, you know what? And that is why re- going back to even what um, Dejan said about relationship is that when I recognize we wrestle not against flesh and come blood, on, and I started recognizing. That might be a demon. That might be her. <laughs> that might be unforgiveness. And the thing is, that spirit is manifesting in this area. This is yeah. another place where that person needs to be healed. And so because of that, one thing, that was something that I learned a little bit later in life. But that was when I had to learn that forgiveness is a lifestyle. Yeah. Facts. Because sometimes we think, well, I have to forgive these major people, but you gotta forgive people even in the small little little things. And um, I had to lay aside a lot of um, revenge, like revengeful mind, like that revengeful mindset. Yeah. Like I just, you know that how Medea was like, you got me, so I got you, and you got got, because if you wouldn't have got me, I would have never got you. Like it was Thanks. just go back. Thanks. That that used to make so much sense to me. Like, yeah. you got me. You got me. Like, yeah. like, you know? And then the Lord was just started real like, to the point, y'all, to the point the Lord has been revealing this to me. Even when it comes down to different leaders in the church, a lot of times we think they're leaders now, they should know better. But healing and forgiveness and dealing with yourself is layers. It's like how Shrek mm-hmm. was like, no, an ogre we is have layers. layers. We yes. like- <laughs> you have layers. And yeah. there is layers to this thing. And so a lot of times you will think that because they're better in this area, they've mastered all areas. And they haven't. So a lot of times, even in leadership, where you be like, why is this leader tripping? Like, what is wrong? What's happening is another layer is being exposed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's strong because anytime you remove another layer of onion, that, that smell is strong as mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's like, okay, that's another place that needs to be buffed. It needs to be chopped up. It needs to be dissected. It needs, you know, it needs yeah. more work. And that was something that I would say is a difference between the black church and white church. Um, Because when I go to predominantly Caucasian churches, love is the big topic. Yeah. Like they, when I tell you, white churches know how to love, black churches know how to warfare. Yeah. Okay. And so (laughs) one thing that I will say is that is the importance of combining because a lot of times, predominantly Caucasian churches don't know how to warfare, and that's how stuff hits them, and they're defeated. Whereas the black church is like, "You better, you better <laughs> tell the cast me out." What a crazy! <laughs> okay, but in, in the black church, we have a hard time loving, yeah, yeah. recognizing the grace and mercy of God. Yeah. So it's like that's the that's why I can't necessarily feel comfortable in just one or the other. I'm like, no, I need. A harmonious everything because I need you to deal with every part of my heart. Uh, yeah. And in that sense, that was something that I wound up learning a little bit later on and I started understanding was, okay, God loves them just as much as he loves me. Yeah. So if he's saying, touch not my anointing to do my prophets no harm. If they're a prophet just like I'm a prophet, I can't touch you and do, your, do you no harm just like you shouldn't be doing me no harm. Right. Um, you know what I'm saying? And just because I don't like you don't mean that God don't love you and hasn't chosen you. Come on. So you better be careful. So you have to be careful of how you treat one another. Yeah. And so that was one thing that I had to learn. And my parents used to tell me, I'm, I'm telling you, as a PK, that was something that I had to learn. Because 
Um, when it says we walk not by sight, you know, I am a very visual person. That's how even the Lord speaks to me. So I watch everything. I'm looking at how you do stuff and I'm like, y'all tripping. Why are you saying they not evil when I know I see a demon? But you know, but <laughs> like you don't demonize the person. Come on. They may have a demon or a spirit that they're dealing with, but that is just the trespasser on their life. You want to speak to the person. Yeah. So they will say these things, but it's not until I had the relationship with Christ where I'm like, oh, okay, okay, okay. Um, yeah, so I agree. Y'all, y'all, y'all preaching on here. Man. All right, so for me, it's two things. Like, I feel like where you were talking about the layers, a, a, a layer being peeled off, even in the church and how people are held, held to the, that standard, for PKs who are just not not just PK, just people in general, people who are living their lives and are in a leadership um, position. I've, I'm learning how to count it as an honor to be able to watch somebody go through that for the simple fact that when I go through something that's similar or have to go through something publicly like that, mm-hmm. I don't know how to handle it. It's like the blueprint is being laid out for you. Like, mm-hmm. this is what you do. This is what you don't do. And the situations might be different, but at the same time, you still have some level of guidance as it relates to that situation. And yes. secondly, I think a part of what I know a part of a huge part of what drew me to Salt Mine in the first place was I came from a predominantly black church. I came to Salt Mine and it was it was black people, but it was black people who had been under the tutelage of that white that white church who taught them how to love. So Facts. it was that love that kept me in the church to begin with. So what you were just saying was just absolutely correct. Yeah, and, and, and that, yeah, that's yeah, right. No, 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 no. But I was just Go gonna ahead. say it was funny because Dejan's first time. Okay, so in in college, all my friends used to be like, "You're so mushy. Like you are just so no <laughs> <laughs> Like you're so excited. You always hugging people. Like that. and I'm looking at them like, well, "Why don't you?" Like you know, like it just it was just a norm. <laughs> and then I remember uh, Dejan visited our old church. And they came up to him, oh, hi. And it was all hugging. And he was like, that's where y'all get that from. Yeah, like, thanks. Oh. <laughs> and that was the first thing he said was like, thanks. this is your family. Like, this is how y'all do stuff. And I'm like, yeah. Like, <laughs> this is it. Like, this is it. So- <laughs> it was like the light bulb went off. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember us just cracking up about it because one thing, um, I always, I, I'll tell my parents, I'd be like, hey, our love has gone down in the house. Like, love between the women or love between the men or love in the, you know, like, it's going down. So how can we boost the love in the yeah. church? What can we do? Um, because sometimes, you know, you because you're underneath it, you don't see it all the time. But then when you go out and come back, I'm like, mm, I love radar. Yeah. It's a little bit down. Like yeah. we, we're not trusting eleven like we're supposed to. Come on, but how can we boost that? So yeah. yeah, that now that goes back to the question that y'all have said about leaving. Sometimes you got to be under different atmospheres to recognize the error, but also the good things that your ministry may have. Yeah, I'd have been to plenty of churches where I was like, my father would never let this happen. <laughs> Never. This is <laughs> and then <laughs> I've been in situations where I was like, "Oh, we really need to implement this. This is really dope." So yeah, but go ahead, Brandon. I'm sorry. No, you never say sorry. You are the guest, and you are allowed to speak whenever the Holy Spirit leads you to speak. Uh, all right, but you know this has uh, been an amazing episode. Uh, we, we would continue to go on and on because that's just how we are, you know. Yeah. Um, but we 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 got stuff we got to do, and we don't want to keep you longer than um, longer yeah. than you need to. You know, we yeah. might have to do a, a part two later. You know, whenever we, you know. But man, that just the um, just the revelations that you have given us, and just also I would say beforehand the. God will always speak to you about the podcast and we thank you for sharing it because this is not, this is not easy. It may look easy to people from the outside or whatever like that. Just us getting on the camera, just talking, 
but it's so much extra stuff that goes into it. Just thinking of podcasts, thinking of how to get it out and push it. And, you know, just you may not see the fruit of your labor right away because it's, it's all about longevity. But you want to see some type of growth. And sometimes that can bother you if you don't. Um, so I just thank you for just encouraging us to just keep pushing because I know God has spoke to me about this uh while ago he was like yeah i need you to have a podcast whatever like that and i was like all right but i was just waiting for the right timing and you know just leading being led by the holy spirit and then just adding adding choosing to add dejan and us pushing this forward i thank you for speaking what god gave you to speak because you could have been like i ain't gonna speak this you know why you always talking about podcast and not you know but you know but i thank you for sharing the words because that definitely helped us for sure. So yeah, Listen, y'all are needed most definitely. Like, just have men out here who are willing to talk. Even with the PK conference, let me show y'all something. I had seventeen people, and only four or five were women. The rest were all men. That's facts. And that was the number one thing that everybody kept saying was, "I'm so glad we finally get to hear men's opinion and men's voices in the church." Wow. When I tell you wow. y'all are needed, literally, it was so many people that was just like, how did you get that many men to talk? So for y'all to sit here and be willing to be a voice for the men in the church, because men have to reclaim their place, have to get back in alignment. So to see that y'all is needed, even seeing your voices, seeing how y'all are hustling, seeing it's needed. It is needed, especially to have the non-toxic conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. podcasts, that's what we I'd be like, we're a whole thing. Whole thing. <laughs> redo, redo this. This is yeah. horrible. Um, so never, never despise small beginnings. For greater is the end of the thing than the beginning. Amen. Um, literally in 2000, what, 17? Was it 17? I was singing and preaching. I have been preaching and singing since 2014. So all the way until 2017, people really didn't know me in Michigan. In 2000, what was it? 15? I'm not sure which year it was. The Lord sent me to China first. I said, how you send me? Fifteen <laughs> hours away, and people in Michigan don't really know my name. Right. And the Lord literally has spoke to me and said, "Who I called you to is who I called you to. Amen. And where I send you is where I send you." And so when He did that, and I was able to talk to people who don't speak English, I needed an interpreter. By the time I got to Michigan, I was like, "Y'all ain't nobody. Like, not that y'all not nobody." <laughs> You know what I'm trying to say to you, <laughs> you know. And to, uh, when it comes to, um, to um, TD Jake said, he said he had certain Sunday services where it was only two, three, four people. He said, but I told myself I'm gonna preach to the angels hey. about the goodness of Jesus until the Lord fills up these pews. Yes. So it doesn't matter how many views. I'm telling you, the Lord is gonna do it. Keep Amen. throwing yourself out there. It's never a failure when the Lord tells you to do it. And that right. is the biggest thing that I want every person to know is when you launch out into the deep, you are not stepping on your own water. You're stepping on God's ocean. You're Come stepping on. out on him. And whatever he wants you to catch, whatever he wants you to, to divide or fill up or reveal, he's going to do it. It's never a failure. Um, and I truly know that out of your two, you two out of our relationship, everything, I know God's hand is on you guys. And Amen. hope medicine is needed and open heart is definitely needed. So Amen. we appreciate you coming on for episode 16. Um, we sure. just thank you for sharing exactly what the Holy Spirit gave you to share. Uh, we just ask you to just continue to be you, continue yeah. to uh, lead and continue to uh, do exactly what the Holy Spirit caused you to do. We just uh, we just honor you 
we honor you for just doing what you're doing. We understand that it's not easy being a preacher kid, but God has called you to it. And you are teaching us because we might probably going to be in them shoes as far as being preachers and having kids. We already got kids. So, so we just thank you uh, for the wisdom because we take this. I was listening to to get wisdom to be like, all right, that's what I that's the thing I shouldn't do. I probably, you know, because it's necessary. So I, I honestly just, have forgot my mom is a PK. Facts. I was raised by a PK. Forgot. <laughs> <laughs> that's crazy. Yeah, it is. But one thing I say is this. Like, for example, when you was talking about the air, and I'm sorry, I know we over time, but... No, we, about, we, we keep going. We keep going. Come on, let's go. <laughs> when we were talking about the just being the heir of a ministry, one thing about it was God had gave me a, a dream and just told me that there's multiple. Uh, that no matter where I'm at, no matter what he calls me to do, there are multiple um, people that... Be, that will be up underneath my father and be planters. Um, And so I've never had it in my mindset of, y'all need to recognize that I'm next. You you get what I'm saying? Yes. It was more so of, okay, you up underneath him, you gonna have to learn him. Yeah. Um, Because the stuff you're doing right now, he ain't gonna he ain't gonna have it. And I want you to still be cool and love your pastor. So let me help you become who I know God has called you to be. Um and honestly, having great people underneath the church and releasing parents, once I really fully released my parents and allowed the people around them to grow. Honestly, it freed me and it freed them and it allowed people to actually step into the Joshua's anointing. It allowed them to be the errands. It allowed them to be those people um, because the more uh, uh, as us as PKs, we try to be controlling. We never allow people to actually step and be who God has called them to be. We can hinder the ministry by not stepping aside sometimes. And that was one thing that I had to learn. Um, I knew when my parents, my dad would say, okay, I want them chairs put out at this time or this time or whatever. He meant that right then and there. And when I would see people still like, ah, I would just start putting the chairs away. Then I'm like, oh no, don't do that. Then they'll start putting it away. But that was my way of saying, listen, God is calling y'all and raising y'all up to be another section of this church. So y'all gonna have to learn how to lead or do stuff. Or it's, it's gonna be a problem because he's about order. So it's just like, sometimes it's PKs, we have to lead without speaking sometimes. Sometimes our mouths get us more in trouble than our actions. Yeah. So that was one thing that I had to learn because the same way, I put it this way. Most of the time, anointings and mantles and different things are passed down through lineage. And what happens a lot of times is that PK that might be very outspoken, may not have a filter, may be just raw, may just like, a lot of times they have a very strong anointing and they're still trying to figure out what to do with it. So she probably wouldn't watch this, but even with my sister Alexis, I'm always like, well, her prophetic gift is very strong. She's still working that thing out. So I watch how God positioned certain people in the church, in her life, that she was able to talk to as she is figuring out her calling. And those are things that I honor because even though I'm her big sister, she's not going to talk to me about everything. She, I know that. We have a big age gap, so sometimes I can come off as sister parent. Yeah. The sister. Um, but Having that discipleship around her, um, I feel like Alexis is going to go even further than I have gone quicker Mm -hmm. because we've actually created an atmosphere in the church that has allowed her to be able to be vocal and actually grow. 
and not feel like it's a bunch of rule books mm-hmm. she's failing. So, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Sorry. All right. Well, we're going to wrap it up. Um, we just thank y'all for listening to the Heart and Hope Medicine podcast, and we are out. Period. Love y'all.